Make sure you have your notebook and your pencil and maybe a calculator handy for this section, 1.4 in your textbook. Title it 1.4 Measurement and we're going to talk about measuring amounts of matter in various different ways. First of all, we're mostly going to use the metric system in this class, although we will convert from the English to the metric or vice versa, just so we can use units that are used a lot in America as well. The metric system has a number of basic or base units that describe the quantity of matter. For example, mass uses the kilogram, length uses the meter, time uses the second, and you can see a few more right down here. I think the mole is a very interesting one that we'll learn a lot about in this, uh, in this course, which gives us the amount of substance. So prefixes illustrate or indicate the fraction or multiples of units in the metric system, also known as the standard international units system. And you need to know what the prefix means, the name of the prefix, the symbol for the prefix, and then how much larger or smaller that prefix means according to a base unit. Now, in your textbook, there's a really nice table, table 1.5 right here, that lists lots of different prefixes, their abbreviation, their meaning, how much larger or smaller they are than a base unit, and then some examples of these, and then they give you it in scientific notation as well. This list that you should memorize is also available for you on Schoology and I have it as a one-tap piece right here, and these are the prefixes, symbols, and how much larger or smaller they are than a base unit listed in a document that's available to you in Schoology right on one of the front pages for you. Converting and moving from various different units and prefixes of units is a critical piece and I'll show you methodologies of doing that as we go along and then you'll have to practice it because you want to get really good at it so you don't have to think about it too much because there'll be plenty of much more difficult things to think of than going like from milliliters to liters. We'll still practice that during this chapter but we assume that you'll get really good at it. Here's a good example of one of the measurements we'll make, length measurements. It can be measured in meters, kilometers, centimeters, or nanometers. And each one of those, of course, would simply be an abbreviation put in front of the word or the, the measurement base unit called a meter. Temperature is also one of the things that we'll measure in chemistry class. And temperature, of course, has three mainly used units. One is called Celsius. Another one is called Kelvin. And the other one that's most commonly used in America is called Fahrenheit. And converting between these is a critical piece in this class. And here are some examples of how they relate to one another. You can see that 273 Kelvin is actually the same as 0 Celsius, which is the same as 32 Fahrenheit, the freezing point of water. And then you can see that there's a 100 degree interval between 0 Celsius and 100 Celsius, also known as the boiling point usually of water. And you can see that's 212 Fahrenheit right here. And notice that's a 180 degree interval here. What's unique and what helps a lot in chemistry is if you recognize that Celsius and Kelvin have the same degree distance between every degree. And so 273 Kelvin is the same as 0 Celsius. 373 Kelvin is the same as 100 Celsius. So you can see that those intervals are exactly the same, whereas for the Fahrenheit, it's not the same. And therefore, when you change between the two, Celsius and Kelvin just simply uses 273. So if you want to go from Kelvin to, to Kelvin from Celsius, just add 273 to the Celsius. If you want to go 2 Celsius from Kelvin, just subtract 273 from the Kelvin. The Fahrenheit uh, change uh, 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 equation is a little bit more difficult because you actually have to take this difference in degree size into account. And so going 2 Celsius from Fahrenheit means you take 5 ninths 
times the Fahrenheit minus 32. An easy way to approximate that when you go to a, 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 a Canada or a European country that uses Celsius, take your Fahrenheit, subtract about 30, and then cut it in half. And then you're pretty close to the Celsius comparison. Another measurement that we'll look at in chemistry class is volume. And volume is actually a derived unit because volume is actually length times width times height, or it's a cubed unit of length. And in figure right here on page 19, you can see that a one centimeter by one centimeter by one centimeter block actually is renamed. Obviously, it's called a cubic centimeter, one times one times one equals one, and then CM with a little cubed up here has a new name called a milliliter. And interchanging these two units is one of the tricky ways that people try to try to uh, like make things difficult in chemistry class. Just know that milliliter and cubic centimeter are the same. Now if you go a little bit larger than this, you can see that a decimeter right here times a decimeter times a decimeter, which give you a decimeter cubed, and that's known as a liter. I know it looks smaller in the book, but they actually like take it from here and show how a meter times a meter times a meter would be way bigger and involve a thousand of these liters. And so a cubic meter is actually one kiloliter, kilo, a thousand times larger than a liter. So make sure you've got these pieces down and the ones to memorize are cubic centimeters the same as a milliliter, cubic decimeters the same as a liter because you'll see those used interchangeably all the time. The last derived unit we'll talk about is one called density. Density is the division of mass and volume. So mass divided by volume is equal to density. And density is an intensive property of matter that can be used to identify a substance. You can see some examples of selected densities of substances over here on page 20 in your textbook. And you can see that uh, air, of course, is not very dense at all. 0 0.001 gram per cubic centimeter, or notice how I wrote it, gram times milliliter to the negative one. If you don't remember from your math class, anytime you have a negative exponent, it actually means it should be that divided by this amount. So gram divided by milliliter. This is just a tricky way to write this to kind of fool you. And you can see another example is water. Water down here would have a density of approximately one gram per cubic centimeter. Or you could write it as gram per milliliter. Or you could write it as grams times milliliter to the negative one. Or you could write it as grams times centimeter to the negative three, because that's grams per cubic centimeter. Any one of those types of units are fair game to be used all the time, just to trick you. A couple of other items are Iron, of course, is much more dense than water, and things that are more dense would sink, or not float, I guess, in uh, mixture with one another. And so that's why uh, if you threw a chunk of iron into water, it would sink to the bottom. Same thing with gold, for example. But if iron and gold were liquid, like heated up until they both melted, the iron would float on top of the liquid gold. Gold has one of the highest densities of substances uh, in, in the world. Note the tricky way to use the per units. Uh, you can see that the negative exponents right here mean per that amount. We'll continue next with a few example problems of density, mass, and volume.